On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the Mississippi is near one of its lowest levels ever. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCogliano. Welcome to today's episode. So this is not an unusual story. We have talked about low levels on the Mississippi River before, but this current level of the Mississippi River is near record, and that is impacting the export of bulk material, largely grain. So let's go ahead and dive into this topic, but not head first because the Mississippi is literally very low. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. So this is the Mississippi River via marine traffic. That light blue thread you see coming up here, that is the Mississippi River, all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up to around Minneapolis, St. Paul in Minnesota. However, there are tributaries off of it. You have the Missouri River, you have the Ohio River. Uh, paralleling it on the lower level here is the Tennessee Tom Bigby uh, or the Ten Tom River. And then, of course, there is the Illinois River to the Chicago Canal, which actually connects you into the Great Lakes. If you're on the eastern side of the Mississippi in the United States, you're on a big honking island if you didn't realize it. That demonstrates the importance that we see with ocean transportation and inland waterway transportation. This story at G Captain by Reuters, Mississippi River near historic lows, putting grain exports at risk. So the issue here is the export of corn and soybean barges over the recent weeks. According to the report, the uh, tow boats and barges have had to lighten their loads. That means instead of loading down to about 11 feet in the barges, they're going down to nine feet. Much lighter loads impact the ability to transport grain. These woes come at a time when U.S. farmers are trying to get corn and soybean out to market. Now, granted, October is usually a low transportation month because a lot of the summer crops have already been loaded and shipped out, just seeing the, uh, the putting in of winter tr crops. However, there is a lot of competition coming for U.S. grain, particularly from Brazil, the area in and around the river to plot. But over the past month, we've seen portions of the river close 22 times, with at least 36 groundings being reported by the Coast Guard. The Mississippi River has dropped to a level of negative 10.62 feet at Memphis. The lowest all time is 10.81 feet on October 21st of last year. And the river is expected to remain this low throughout the month. And again, this is going to impact our ability to get grain out. Uh, goes on here, talks about uh, from the executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, Mike Stenhoek. October is not normally a robust precipitation month, and if we're already, and if we're here already, it's a real cause for concern. All right, let's break this down and take a look at it. So, drought is a major feed into the rivers. Now, you'll notice there's a large drought here along the Gulf of Mexico region. That's not the issue. It is the drought up above on the rivers that feed into the Mississippi River. So rivers up here on the northern side of the Mississippi River and then along the Missouri and some of the western tributaries that are not feeding into the river. If you do not get rain on those elements, it creates a big problem. The Bureau of Transportation Statistics, we're going to be looking at a lot of stats here from the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, did this report last year in November, low water on the Mississippi slows critical freight flows. Mississippi River provides a vital link for freight. In 2020, the, the river carried more than half of the 165.5 million tons that moved between the 12 states touching the upper Mississippi system. The percentage of freight carried by the river to Louisiana is much higher for some states. 92% for Indiana, 81% for Missouri, 80% for Illinois, 75% for Kentucky. And if you look at that total amount of tonnage, 56 went by water, 14 by rail, 16 by pipeline, 6 by truck, and then 7 by a multiple of modes. And you can see how that plays out here in terms of moving goods, particularly bulk products like grain down the Mississippi. This is from the National Weather Service. This shows you the gauges. These are the measurements along the rivers here. And while you see a lot of green here indicating no flooding, the key here are the brown ones that are along the Mississippi River. These are the areas that are showing low water. So here's the gauge at Vicksburg showing you roughly right around between two and one feet low levels. Here's the one near Greenville, Mississippi right around six, uh, six to seven feet going up here. This is up at Helena, I believe, yeah, Helena, Arkansas, 
showing you right around four feet. And again, just above that, you're seeing here at Tanika Mahone, right around 10 feet. And this is the Memphis gauge. And the Memphis gauge is the one that we've been watching a lot. It's a key one for really getting us out of the area. And Memphis is sitting there right now at about 10 feet. It's scheduled to tick back up here just a little bit, but then drop again down. And as long as the river's in those low states, it creates a lot of problem when you're at low water you can't carry as many barges on your toes. So these push boats that push the barges down will typically can have up to about 40 barges. But when the river gets low, the channel gets narrower, it gets shallower, and it's more difficult to get around these narrower turns. And that means not only do you have to load the barges lighter, but you can't load as many barges with you. At the same time, the US Coast Guard has to go out and reposition aids of navigation. So a lot of the channels are marked with buoys. Buoys float to the surface, they have chains and they're anchored down to the bottom. But as the river gets lower, those buoys float further away from their anchor points. And that indicates where the channel is. And if it's too wide, it can actually lead to grounding. So you're continually having to reset your aids of navigation as the river level drops. And once the river starts to rise, you have to again, reset it. This is a 2018 map by BTS. The Bureau of Transportation Statistics shows you how freight and cargo is moved around the United States. The purple is the interstate highway. Interstate highway system was one of the key innovations in the 1950s and 60s that really was, was an end for a lot of coastal shipping, Jones Act trade, because now you can move goods along the highways. Uh, the green there is railway, and so you see a lot of freight moving by railway, principally from the West Coast all the way across into the interior of the United States. We learned this during the supply chain crisis. This one really large kind of thick area here, this is northeastern Wyoming. This is ore coming out, massive amounts of ore coming out of that region. And then finally, blue is inland waterways. And you can see how the inland waterways feed down to about St. Louis. Above St. Louis, you actually have a system of locks. And the lock system north of St. Louis prohibits the size of your tow boats and barges. You can only have a 15 boat tow going up to that region. Uh, below it, you have much larger. You have the, up to the 40 barges. But this is where you see that number really increase. And then, of course, the whole Ohio River here. So it really demonstrates to you how goods are moved around in the interior of the United States. If you take this snapshot of the water transportation system, this comes from BTS's Transportation Statistics Annual Report for 2022. I'll have all this in the show notes for you to look at. You can see how many vessels are operating in the inland waterways. In 2020, about 44,501 vessels. Of those 44,000, about three-fourths are barges and non-self-propelled vessels. So you have a lot of barges operating on the inland waterways. About 10,000 self-propelled vessels, 11.8 million recreational boats. So a lot of recreational boats in the United States. But then if you look at waterborne commerce in terms of millions of tons, interesting to note here how the number has decreased from 2000 to 2020. And you see it a lot on the domestic side, not as much movement of grain and goods on the domestic side. A lot of reason for that. Uh, again, competition from overseas. You're shifting the modes of transportation uh, using rail a little bit more. But all those play a factor here in the development. Next, I'm going to show you this report, a great report by BTS, the Port Performance Freight Statistics Program. This is an annual report to Congress, and in it, they have to make some key elements, and it really demonstrates the size of ports in the interior of the United States. So this chart here in this table, excuse me, shows you the list of top 25 ports by dry bulk tonnage, ranked by short tons. And you can see right in the very beginning, the top three are right in Louisiana, right at the bottom of the Mississippi River where they catch it. Matter of fact, if you throw in Baton Rouge, that's four of your top five. Virginia coming in there at number four. And in truth, half of the top 25 ports are all in and along tributaries and the Mississippi River. When you look at the map here, you can see what role they play all the way from the four big uh, Louisiana ports up until the region here right around St. Louis, along the Mississippi River, 
all the way up into the Great Lakes region. And you see a couple of ports here, Two Harbors, Duluth, Northern uh, Indiana, Northern District. Those are all up and along the Great Lakes. And then the Columbia River out in the northwest part of the United States is another major system where we see operations of bulk shipping. So in terms of the type of grain that's moved, about two thirds of the total grain is soybean and the other third is corn, about 69 to 31%. This shows you the monthly downbound barge grain shipments. Uh, this is going through Mississippi lock number 27. It measures the tonnage. And so you see 2020 in that solid blue line right there. 2021 is in a dash gray line. And then 2022 in the blue uh, dash dot line. And one of the things that you see very clearly is October is a low month. It tends to be where you see the dip, principally in 2021, 2022, where there was a big, massive dip that took place. However, after October, you have that rebound up. And the problem becomes if there's not rain in October, can the river traffic support that kind of kickback as the tonnage needs to come back up? That's the big question and the big fear that's looming right now. Should we not get enough rain to bring the lower Mississippi back up? Ironically, if it doesn't come back up, what we have seen historically in October is extremely high freight rates. Because as the amount of cargo is diminished that can come down, the cost to charter the barges and to get your grain out gets more expensive. If you have a lot of barges, there's a lot of avenues to move your cargo, rates are typically low. But as the Mississippi lowers, there's less barges, you gotta lighten those barges, less traffic going through, freight rates jump immensely. As you see right here, early in 2020, you were looking at freight rates of right around $10. But then all of a sudden, last year and the previous years, we've seen freight rates talk, clock over $100. And that becomes significant for the cost of food and obviously for you, the consumer and the shipper. So one final chart from this report, this is the top 25 ports by dry bulk tonnage. Looked at them before, you can see where they're getting that tonnage from. The inland waterways are almost entirely domestic that you're seeing it come from. There's a little bit of imports and exports on the Great Lakes, but in the inland waterways, almost entirely from that. And down on the lower Mississippi, you can see where the, those bulk materials is coming for, from. A lot of it's heading out for export. You're bringing grain in and then you're loading it onto large grain vessels in the lower Mississippi, heading out around the world for transportation. Baton Rouge, New Orleans, uh, Southern Louisiana, and uh, plock mines, I don't know how to say that. My Cajun is not great. So the entity that oversees the rivers is not the U.S. Coast Guard. The Coast Guard oversees the aids of navigation, but it's actually the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers are the assigned mission specialists for maintaining the inland waterways of the United States. And specifically what we see here is the Mississippi Valley Division that does that. I wanna highlight a couple of uh, issues they show here on this site, some great information they have. So navigation, uh, one of the things they talk about here is navigation on this waterway. And one of the things you see here are some great stats I want to show you. Here's your typical 15 uh, barge tow coming down or push uh, barges coming down, uh, tow boat and barges coming down, three across, five long. 4,267 miles of commercial waterways, 11 inland waterway systems, one third of the entire U.S. inland waterways. They move 47% of the U.S. inland waterways. 669 tons of cargo move on the Mississippi River each year, seven deep draft ports, 51 shallow draft ports, $6.2 billion in domestic trade. Absolutely a staggering figure. And I want to show you this last chart because I think this is one of the great ones to convey why the inland waterway system is so important. This is from National Waterways Foundation's org. And one of the things they show you is, is exactly what these barges can do. So if you have a standard barge, a standard kind of hopper barge, that's a barge that can carry about 1,750 tons, over 56,000 bushels or 1.6 million gallons of fuel or oil. One barge is equivalent to 16 rail cars that's equivalent to 70 large semi-tractor trailers when you put those barges together into a 15 barge tow along with their tow boat 
you would require six locomotives, 216 rail cars. And if you're doing it on a tractor trailer, 1,050 semis. Understand those 15 barge tows, that's on the upper Mississippi. That's the limits of the lock system going north of St. Louis. When you come south of St. Louis, you are usually operating anywhere from a 15 to a 40 a barge tow. And that is an amazing amount of tonnage that you see. You can really get the equivalency of why the Mississippi River and the inland waterway systems is so important to the United States and an area that I think we don't put enough emphasis on in infrastructure. If you look at the infrastructure bill that was passed during the Biden administration, almost all that money is going to everything but shipping and very little going to the inland waterway system. We need to do more to invest in our inland waterway systems, need to improve uh, dredging and, and, and methods to ensure that we can get tugs and barges up and down the rivers at all times, aids of navigation. We need lock improvement. Our lock system has a lot of difficulties. We see a lot of locks go down and that clogs up the system. Just need a lot more investment in this key area. This is strategic. It is national security. And if you really want to understand the history of both the operation of U.S. international shipping and U.S. inland waterways, then I really recommend Alex Rowland's book, The Way of the Ship. Uh, great book, looks at the history of the United States' uh, maritime environment from 1600 to 2000. Excellent book, some great chapters on the inland waterway system and the development of it. Absolutely superb if you want some good background in history. I hope you enjoy, enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, and if you can, give it a big thumbs up. You can also support the page. How do you do that, Sal? Well, you can hit that super thanks button down below where you can contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon, become a monthly yearly subscriber. You get access to these videos early like this one, or you can go ahead and make recommendations for future videos. Until our next video, this is Sal signing off.